Hello and welcome to week 10 of Introduction to Psychology. Today we're going to be talking about motivation and sexual behavior. So when you think about motivation, realize that, you know, how much of us, again, it goes to the unconscious and conscious. How much of us is driven by our unconsciousness, by our physical processes, by our unconscious mind, and how much of us is motivated by our consciousness, for example. For example, we have these sex drives. We have drives for hunger. You know, what is actually motivating us? And how is motivation eventually we're going to relate it to emotion? So motivation is this process that determines reinforcement value of an outcome. Motivation is a physiological process that is often simulated by the biological responses. It's also motivated by your way your thinking works, cognition, and motivation is also influenced by the social context, such as rewards and the need to avoid punishment. So the three theories of motivation the book covers involve subheadings such as drive theories, homeostasis, and incentive theories, and then we also get into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So drive th theories is think about all of the biological needs that you have. A lot of our behavior is motivated to either fulfill those drives or turn those drives off. So for example, if our hunger drive is motivating us to go find food, we then engage in behavior to go find food to, try to turn the drive off. So homeostasis is this idea that we're motivated to maintain the balance of our body. So we take steps to motivate. When we're hungry, we go find food. When we need sex, we go find sex. All of this balances out our biological needs. And the best way to think about homeostasis is like the thermometer in your house. It turns on when you need to heat or cool the house, and it turns off once the house is at the perfect temperature, for example. And then incentive theories, again, this is the cognitive and social perspective of things that you desire or things that you want to avoid in the social context, okay? Maslow's hierarchy of needs talks about how when it comes to our drives, first we take care of our physiological drives, food, drink, you know, warmth, shelter, safety needs like security and safety after that. Once our safety and physiological needs are taken care of, then we start to concern ourselves with the sense of belongingness and love. Once those are taken care of, we start to focus on our esteem needs like job prestige, fame, accomplishment. And then you have the top tier, which is self-actualization. This means fulfilling your human potential. And then even beyond that, Maslow went a little bit further and he started talking about once you've actually fulfilled your potential, then it becomes about finding meaning in your life. And this is the hierarchy of needs, the hierarchy of motivational, biological, psychological, and sociological drives, okay? So when it comes to hunger, again, hunger is a physiological response, but it's also involved with cognition and the social environment. So as we discussed when we talked about the endocrine system, for example, our bodies release hormones to let our brain know that we're hungry, okay? And then that tells our brain to then tell our body to go out and find food. So you find this with glucose and insulin, different hormones and different surges of energy that are required to be fulfilled. So your body is motivated by... You know, what is your mind telling you about hunger? And your mind is motivated by what your body is telling you about hunger. But again, it's more than just the body, for example. Because when you study brain damage, for example, some people who have damage to the hypothalamus, for example, their sense of hunger is just not as broken. So they can never, ever feel fulfilled, for example. But then hunger is also a sociological process in the idea that you know, much of our eating habits are constructed in the social world. So again, the book talks about obesity, and the question is obesity, how much of obesity is genetics? How much of obesity is your cognitions? And then how much of obesity is your way of life? You know, how you express yourself and behave in the social context, and how you're influenced by others, for example. Okay, so all of us have this basic set point. You know, our body has a homeostatic set point and we're all trying to measure up to that however the set point grows and adjusts depending on the social context how much food intake we're taking in and then whether or not we have enough food take taking in okay so um, the hypothalamus as this shows you is definitely involved with the regulation of eating and drinking and sexual behavior and other motivated drives okay so again these motivations for psycho for uh, sexuality motivations for hunger, a lot of this is a mind and body process, but so much of it is also constructed in the social context, okay? So, for example, people eat more in groups than when they're eating alone. 
Uh, you might eat more, drink more, and enjoy their meal more when they have high expectations for the meal, for example. These are all just common social contexts. Like if you really like something, you, you know, you go a little bit too far, you keep eating, you might have second dessert, third dessert, one creme brulee is not enough, it's so good, you might want to have two, okay? So how much of that process is based upon the social context, and then how much of that is based upon your cognitions, and how much of that is your body actually wanting one, two, three creme brulees, because I know I could go for a few right now. So again, the book talks a lot about obesity, and it really gets into this biopsychosocial process of what hunger is and why people might eat too much and then other factors of them not eating enough. And it talks about both. It talks about the experiments, when it happens when people are starving, and then it gets deep into obesity and the causes of obesity, okay? It also talks about other eating disorders such as anorexia, and this is when you're afraid to gain weight so you don't eat enough, and then bulimia, which goes back and forth between self-deprivation uh, and then excessive eating, and then feeling loss of control, and then as a result to compensate for them losing control and eating too much in their subjective opinion. Um, then they often, you know, might force themselves to vomit, for example. And it's, you know, these are tough things that we have to deal with in life, okay? A lot of it's based upon body image and the social context, and a lot of it's based upon genetics and DNA, for example, okay? Um, sexual motivation like hunger, there's a lot of overlap because they're both these biopsychosocial processes. Our bodies are driving us, our cognitions are interpreting the senses from the environment and from our body, and then our minds and our bodies are then influenced by the social context. And much of our sexuality, for example, is constructed in the social context and controlled in the social context, okay? So, when you look at sexuality, for example, customs vary. In America, it's mar far more acceptable in modern times to identify as homosexual, for example, than it was in the past. You know, is our culture in modern America different than cultures in the past? And then if you go to other countries, like historically, you know, homosexuality was incredibly common. Alexander the Great was homosexual, for example, our greatest conqueror in all of human history. Um, but that was just very common back then in Greek culture and Roman culture. And so you see the Spartans and even them were into some pretty dark things like child pedophilia and things like that. So when you look at history and you start to look at sexual orientation and you start to look at sexuality, you realize that humans are pretty much potentially capable of almost anything. Okay, with the exception of some arguments against um, evolutionary getting with your kin, for example. So we have a lot of that built into us that there's some things that the body is very against, such as incest. But there's other things that the body is quite capable of. So the idea of sexuality is this idea that sexuality exists along a continuum. But where we are within that continuum, somewhere between homosexual and non-homosexual, somewhere between hetero and homosexual, lies all of us. And so the book talks about the Kinsey experiments and really going out and asking people, how do you feel about sexuality? Because we're all motivated sexually, but what we're attracted to and what we're aroused by is also a biopsychosocial process. And that our biology has these predispositions. And then our thoughts influence what we think is possible. And the social context decides what is acceptable and what is not, for example, okay? In modern times, you're seeing some pretty big changes. Again, not only are we starting to see where people are beginning to exist along the continuum between heterosexuality and homosexuality, but because of the health increases in modern times, people are hitting puberty at an early age. But despite the fact that we're hitting puberty at an early age, we're still waiting until later in life before we have kids and before we get married in the United States, for example, okay? Plus you have the ability to take, you know, protection and contraceptions and some other factors that are reducing the birth rate. But again, our expression of sexuality in modern times is very different than it would have been like in the past, for example. You know, four out of ten women in modern times will have babies out of wedlock, for example. 15% uh, of people are not even having babies anymore, for example. So this idea of our sexual habits, you know, our sexual behavior is, again, a biopsychosocial thing. What is your body telling you? How is your mind perceiving all the sensation, perceiving what's going on in your body, what's going on in the social context? And then how does the social context influence your idea of sexuality, for example, okay? So when the book does talk about sexual arousal and the phases from excitement to plateau to orgasm to resolution, and again, all of these stages are biopsychosocial processes. What excites us requires that emotional, that physical response, but it also requires us to interpret what we're seeing, what we're being stimulated by, 
And so what we're stimulated by and what we tend to like is influenced again by the biological processes and the social context, what we're allowed to be excited to, to what's acceptable to be excited about, for example. Okay, so sexual development, men, our sexual development and the idea of our bodies forming into men begins in the womb with the release of testosterone for men and estriodol for women. Okay, so how many sexes are there is a really good question and the answer is a minimum of three there are males females and intersex and intersex can be anywhere in a range between masculine and feminine male and female okay so for example if your mother had too high of androgen levels and released too much testosterone in the womb but you were supposed to be genetically born as a female you might find that you start to have these ambiguous chromosomes and genitalia for example and so the result is intersex okay and so intersex is somewhere on the continuum between male and female and it is a genetic blend and it's a really good debate whether intersex is something of a defect or whether intersex is an evolutionary adaptation is a whole different question but the main point is that, that there are a minimum of three sexes okay and so the sex itself exists on a continuum as does sexual orientation okay so when you're looking at sexual orientation the idea of sexual orientation is sexual orientation exists along a continuum nobody is 100 percent straight and nobody is 100 percent gay for example okay so we all are somewhere within that range of straight to gay and that's the way our genetics works okay is there a genetic link to being gay absolutely that is something that has been debated for a very long time, but now in modern times we have the answers. And yes, there is an association between our sexual orientation, what excites us, what arouses us, what gets our body aroused in the first place, okay? So our genes are involved in that process. But again, how you interpret your genes and how you interpret your desires then influences the sexual orientation that you go toward and then what is acceptable in the social context also influences your sexual orientation hence the idea of the closet so i've always been very against the closet because it upsets me the idea that somebody would have to go hide in the closet and they couldn't truly be themselves because society was intolerant toward anybody that didn't identify as straight so if you were non-straight then you had no choice for a long long time but to reside in the closet out of fear of harm or prejudice or discrimination for example but now in modern times we've opened up the door to gender exists on a continuum beyond man and female uh, sexual orientation exists on a continuum beyond male and female so now our gender identity itself our sense of ourselves as male female or oriented or intersex then is also on a continuum okay because again i'm a dad i have children i play both roles of mom i play the roles of dad i hug my children i do the masculine things i do the feminine you know my gender identity what is it do i feel gender identity is exclusively male but i do so many things that are feminine so how does that influence my gender identity for example okay uh so there are major differences between men and women and when it comes to our sexuality uh, and when it comes to our sexual orientation, there are a few differences here also. The book does talk about how women have a little bit more of a tend to lean toward homosexuality. I don't know if any of that is actually supported in evidence. Um, that's one of the things I was definitely questioning in the book a little bit. Um, but this again, we all have this slight bisexuality, attraction toward both sexes. And you have to ask, is that an evolutionary adaptation? Because if it wasn't an evolutionary adaptation, why would that be in our genes and why would it keep coming up culturally over and over and over again for thousands of years so somewhere in us our sexuality extends far beyond just you know going with the opposite sex for example okay so again there are many genetic influences to sexual orientation and if again i talk about this a lot but again if you just look at you know the experience of pregnant women and testosterone and how this is actually going and then that effect on sexual orientation your effect on gender identity simply having too much testosterone in the womb for example then is associated with your sexual orientation and what you are interested in okay so again this is a pretty complex chapter uh, but I really like it. Again, we're looking at the physiological drives of the body. We're looking at hunger and sexual drives. And then we're looking at how these 
drives are then you know molded in the social context for example when you're hungry you can't just go out and steal so even though you're hungry you have to find a way to achieve your goals within the social context within what's acceptable and what's not acceptable for example the same thing goes for sexuality because not all things are acceptable um, please email with any questions and i hope you guys have a wonderful week